Well, good morning, Pleasant Valley. Um, welcome to Sunday School. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure uh, for me to be able to come uh, to you again uh, with uh, another Sunday School lesson. You know, <clears throat> we're blessed uh, to be able to do what we're doing um, and the support from the church family. You know, we're not together in person, but, you know, doing church this way, um, we're together in spirit. And uh, we're still receiving the Word of God. Uh, the Word of God is being preached. And it's just a wonderful thing that we have this technology uh, to still um, come together in a way and uh, study God's Word. And um, I know that, uh, you know, we've just been blessed to have, you know, the number of people watching. I think God's blessing. And, and it's just a wonderful thing. Um, now, I can't wait till we get back together in person. I tell you what, it's just... You know, it bothers me to not be with my church family. And, you know, even even my personal family, my brothers and sisters, run into my brother at, at the store the other day, and and <laughs> he he picked me up and toted me halfway through the store. you got to know my brother uh, to know um, that that's just kind of stuff he does. But, you know, it was good to see his face. It was good to, you know, embrace him and, and uh, to be able to, to be together and, I can't wait to be together with y'all again, and I know y'all feel the same way, and I am looking forward to that day. I'll tell you something else I can't wait. Y'all see this mop on top of my head? I can't wait for Misty Henderson to be able to get back to work and cut my hair. Amen? I'll tell you what, this, it's, it's, it's time. It is time. So, anyhow. All right, so um, remember the last time um, that I was with y'all um, doing Sunday school, we were in the book of Ephesians, and uh, so we stopped at about verse 15 of chapter 5. Um, and what I thought we'd do this week is just kind of pick up right there, or really a few verses later, and, and study God's Word through the end of chapter 6. Um, there's about 32 verses that we're going to study tonight, so uh, you know, hopefully uh, this one may not be quite as long as the last one was. I didn't realize I talked that long last time, but but it, it was good. The Lord blessed and, and the Lord's word went out. But uh, now some of my youth may tell me or tell you that it doesn't matter what I say, it's always going to be long. But maybe this one won't be as long as the last one. So um, grab your Bibles. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, we're going to uh, read verse 15. Uh, through verse 21. We're just going to kind of read through that to finish up, and then we're going to start um, really uh, discussing things in uh, verse 22. All right. Uh, verse 15 says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, verse 22 is really wanna, where I want to uh, pick up and, and start studying a little bit here. Uh, verse 22 says, Wives, submit your, uh, excuse me, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, don't turn me off. Just bear with me here a minute, and, uh, and we're going to see, I'm going to bring out a point that maybe some of y'all have never noticed about that, because we got a lot of people that like to quote that verse. But the problem is they don't go any further, and that's where the issue comes in. So let's read that again and read on through. Wives, submit, your, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. So we not only see <clears throat> that wives need to submit to their husbands that's true that's very true but see it's taken out of context because the rest of the verse is kind of left out it's like somebody 
erased it out of their Bible, and they like to quote those that first little verse. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Okay, so Christ is the authority over the church, and the church goes to Christ for everything they need. We trust Christ for everything we need. We, we put our trust and faith in him that he's going to supply our every need. Okay, so that's the reason that wives submit to their husbands is because they should be able to trust husbands that they can go to you for every need they have, any need they have. Okay, so Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Okay, then now that word savior holds a lot of weight. Now, husbands, think about yourself in, in the manner of Christ being the Savior of the church. And, and if wives are, sub, are to submit to us husbands as the church submits to Christ, then how does that say that we ought to be? What does that say that we ought to be to our wives? See, I think husbands have a greater responsibility than the wives do, according to what Paul wrote in Ephesians. Christ is the Savior of the church. That has so much meaning. Go back and study the word Savior and, and, and realize what the word Savior means and what this is teaching us. We should be as a Savior to our wives, husbands. Now, this next verse. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. The church is totally subject to Christ. The church is a follower in every capacity of Christ, and wives should be able to and should submit to their husbands in the same way. Next verse, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, how much did Christ love the church? Look, Brother Steve, I found my tea so easy. That's a little inside joke. How much did Christ love the church? To the point that he gave himself up for her. Think about Christ leaving his throne in heaven, a perfect place, a perfect environment, and coming down to an imperfect world with sin everywhere, with imperfection everywhere, with hurt and pain and death and sorrow everywhere you look. He came to an imperfect place from his perfect throne in heaven. Why? To give himself up for the church. See, he didn't just come, but he led by example his whole life. He led the church by example. He showed us how we ought to be by what he was, how he uh, operated and, and went about daily life. So we can see the example of how we should live by the life of Christ when he was here. But see, he didn't just come to show us how to live, but he came to die for us on our behalf. See, we deserved what he got. And he got what we deserved. Husbands, this is what we should be to our wives. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, we should be willing to do anything that we can for our wife. Because Christ did everything he could for us. Even to the point of death. He taught us how to live. 
He showed us how to love others. And he made the ultimate sacrifice for us. Husbands, we got to do that for our wives. That he may sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Husbands, we ought to be the spiritual leaders of our homes. Not just to our children, but to our wives. See, we shouldn't leave that up to the wives. Christ didn't leave it up to the church to figure out how to be spiritual and how to live and, and how to understand the word and live by the word. No, Christ taught us all of that. Husbands, we should be that to our wives. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he may present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Remember, when we come together in marriage, two members of flesh become one. Okay? So, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, because spiritually you are. He who loves him, his wife loves himself. Now, I've already noticed something here that you may have picked on, up on as well. I didn't realize it for many years, but, you know, um, going back to those people who like to quote that first verse, verse 22, and stop at, at the end of verse 22, they haven't realized this, but there was, what, three verses on instructions to the wives? But there were five or six verses, because we've made it down to verse 28, instructing the husband. What does this tell me? This tells me that the greater responsibility in this husband and wife relationship rests on the shoulders of the husband. We have a greater responsibility to be that leader so that the wife will be spiritually subject, as the Bible teaches, in the right way that the Bible teaches so. Okay? It, this is not teaching, and you haven't seen it anywhere here, that um, the husband is the head of the household and the wife's got to do everything he says and never question it. No, that, that, that is false teaching. So, you know, I, I don't know that anybody uh, watching this right now believes that, but if you do, please go study this scripture. Don't take my word for it, please. Never, never take a, a preacher or a teacher's word for the teaching that they're given. No, never do that. You prove their teaching by studying the Word of God yourself and praying and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. That's how we ought to be treating our wives, husbands. We need to be nourishing them, cherishing them, just as Christ does the church. Think again, the, the, the relationship of Christ to the church, the relationship of uh, the, uh, Christ and a, a person who is saved, a follower of him. We depend on him for everything. And we can trust that he will provide everything and that he knows better than we do. This is the relationship that should be between husband and wife. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, another responsibility of the husband there, and the two shall become one flesh. We just talked about that. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you 
love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, husbands, you need to give the wife something to respect. Okay, so we're going to move on to chapter 6 now. And we're going to see as we read on through this that, that um, every person in the family is addressed here. So Paul doesn't just talk to the wife. He doesn't just talk to the husband. But there are responsibilities of every member of the family that's listed here in Ephesians. Um, so let's start at chapter 6, verse 1. Children... Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. Now, this is another popular verse um, that is taught in children's church and Sunday school for, for children. And it's a great verse uh, to teach to the children. Um, it, it shows their responsibility in the family unit. Um but I don't believe that this stops at the point um, where we leave our father and mother and, and, and cleave to our spouse. There's an element of this, adults, that we should still have today. Um, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. Um, you know, a lot of times as adults, you know, we... We're adults, and we go our own way and make our own decisions, and, and we ought to do that. We're, we're taught that we're able to, you know, get out on our own and, and uh, leave father and mother and cleave to your spouse. But honoring your father and mother goes on. See, there's so many families that have such heartache and, and, and pain and, and fighting and such contention in them. Uh, look, I've, I've been a part of that. Um, but just because you don't agree with something that your father or mother um, tries to suggest to you about a certain thing in your life, um, it doesn't mean you can't disagree with them, but you do so with honor um, to your parents. Uh, they, they raised you. They brought you in. God use them to bring you into this world. And that in itself is something to honor. Um, but, you know, going back to children and, and teenagers, uh, we should always obey our parents in the Lord, okay? Um, you know, this doesn't, um, speaking to the teenagers here and the children, um, God doesn't expect you to, um, if, if your parent instructs you to do something that is an outright blatant um, sin or against the law. Um, this, this is not saying that you have to do those type of things. And this is just my personal belief. Um, and, and I believe that the Bible supports that. But um, you, you should say, look, I, you know, I, I'm a follower of Christ and, and I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be disrespectful. But I, I'm just not going to do that, and I hope you respect that of me wanting to be a follower of Christ. But there's, that is very, very few and far between. That doesn't happen very often. Um, so children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And that is, again, the only commandment, or the first commandment, with a promise that you'll live long on the earth. Okay, So you're promised by obeying your parents uh, because, guess what? Um, you don't like hearing this, but they're smarter than you. <laughs> they, they've been through a lot that you ain't been through yet, and some of the things that they thought when they were teenagers and children, um, they grew up and, and they've learned to see things differently. And uh, some of the things that you <laughs> say, well, I'll never say that to my kid when, when I have kids. Yeah, you will. <laughs> I promise you, yeah, you will. But you just... You know, through experience and through life, you see things differently as you become an adult. So children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Now we go right back to the fathers. Fathers, you have the responsibility of the household. 
on your shoulders. You are as Christ is to the church. You are as Christ to your family. Go, go back and study the life of Christ from birth to death and resurrection. And that will show you what you need to be to your family. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you my personal opinion of what this verse means. Uh, fathers, do not pro provoke your children to anger. You know, it's kind of the, the manly, the macho thing to, um, you know, you got the guy things with your boys, you know. And, you know, some of those things may not quite match up with the Word of God or may not quite support um, how you should be following Christ. Um, and to me, that always leads to a life that will drive you to anger uh, and, and lead you into a life that, that you will struggle with certain things that, and I've been guilty of this. There's one particular thing that I'm thinking about that, that you know, me and Cameron used to kind of cut up about a little bit, and, and you know, Rebecca pointed that out to me after we got married, and, and she said, you, know, you, ought not to, you ought not to do that. That's, you know, that, that's not right. And, you know, at the time that she said that, I was like, come on now. That's just, you know, it's just guy stuff, you know. It's not, it's not that bad. I mean, come on now. But as I, as I thought about it, and as I prayed about it, and as I studied the Word, she was right. And, and thank God that she brought that out to me. And, uh, and, and I, I, didn't, I stopped doing that. So um, those type of things can, can lead children as they get older into things um, that are, are much... Um, bigger and badder <laughs> than, than uh, what, you're, what you're participating in with your kids. All right, so fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Here is yet another responsibility to the fathers as the head of the household um, and, and given that mandate by Christ that we should bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Not what you think is right, not what you think is best, but we ought to be searching out Scripture to see how we ought to be raising our children. Because Scripture will identify exactly how we ought to, and, and teach us exactly how we ought to raise our children. And, and they will be blessed because of that, and you will be blessed because of that, and your wife will be blessed because of that. Okay, let's move on to uh, verse 5. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Okay, so, you know, when it talks about bond servant, you know, we, we don't really use that word today. We, we don't really have bond servants per se. But I think about our um, employer and employment, our work relationship, uh, when, when I read this verse. So I would almost uh, replace that word bond servant with employee. Employee, obey, obey your earthly employers, your bosses. Employee, obey your earthly boss with fear and trembling. Now see, that's where I've fallen before too. Um, I, I had a boss that I disagreed with about 99% of the time. Um, I've learned to love that person. <laughs> we didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. And I can, I can look back to that time in my life 
And I can see where I was wrong. In a lot of ways, I was wrong. Now, the principle that I had in my mind and, and the principal point that I was trying to make in those situations a lot of times was correct, but the way I went about it was absolutely wrong. According to this verse, employees obey your bosses with fear and trembling. Respect. Just like children should honor their father and mother, we as employees should honor our boss. And we're going to see why here in just a minute. With a sincere heart, as you would Christ. So we are to respect and honor our boss with a sincere heart. If our heart ain't right, we need to pray that God make it right. See, sometimes we have to start out doing it because we know that's what we're supposed to do. And we need to pray, God, I'm doing this because you're commanding me to do it, but I don't want to do it. Help me want to do it. And he will. He's done that in my life. So work toward having that sincere heart as you would Christ. So, so don't do it just because they're your boss. Don't do it just because this scripture tells you to, but do it as you would honor Christ. If, if Christ stood before you, and, and gave you a job to do and instructed you in something, I think most of us would, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. <laughs> we'd, we'd all be yes men, wouldn't we? So this is telling us that we ought to respect and obey our employers and bosses and managers and supervisors just like we would Christ. But the next part, listen to this, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers. Look, we're not doing this simply for the sake of our boss. This is not telling us to be a brown noser. This, this is telling us to, to obey them the way that we would Christ, not for eye service, not just do what the boss says when they can see you doing it. Or, or when they're not around, do it because you know they're going to come back and see the results of your work. Not just because of that, because that's what people pleasers do. See, we're not people pleasers. We're people lovers. But can I tell you, we're never going to please people as Christians. We may please some people, but... Probably not most of them. So we shouldn't do this as a way of eye service, brown nosing, just trying to make our boss happy, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. The, doing the will of God for the heart. What is the will of God? Everything we just talked about that. Honoring, respect, and obeying your boss. But doing it from the heart, it goes back to that with a sincere heart, as you would Christ that we just talked about. If, if you have to start out with an insincere heart, um, pray that God would change your heart, and he will. If you are sincerely praying that God may, uh, uh, empower you to do it with a sincere heart, he will empower you to do it with a sincere heart. Rendering service with goodwill as to the Lord and not man. See, we, sh we shouldn't be doing this just, just to obey our boss. We should be doing this as we are obeying the Lord because this is what he commands us to do. And, and I, I think of this often at work. You know, some days I go in, I don't feel the best, and my boss... I'm, I'm the boss in my office, but my boss is not in my office. Very rarely is my boss in my office. And really, I could get by with going in many days 
and just be like, you know, I, I just don't feel like working hard today. I just kind of feel like just coasting through the day, waiting on 530. And I could get away with that for a long time. Now, there, there are certain things that would kind of catch up with me. And in the end, it would not pay off. I guarantee you that. But I'm not there to obey my boss for the sake of obeying my boss. And the Holy Spirit reminds me of this when I go in and have those feelings of, you know, I don't really feel like doing anything today. And I could get by with it if I wanted to. I hear that still small voice that says, I'm here. Ain't you supposed to really be doing this for me? Isn't that what I commanded you to do? And uh, and it makes a difference. You know, I, you know, it's funny, but I <laughs> when that happens, I picture I got two office chairs sitting across my desk where customers sit. And it's like I see him sitting there. And after that, you know, well, that, that thought is over. <laughs> Time to get to work. Okay. Let's see where we're at here. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or free. So, obeying this and, and any of God's word will always come back and become a blessing to us. Always. Well, verse 9 switches gears here again. It says, Masters, let's replace that with bosses. Bosses, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Okay, you, 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 you hear that there? You, you see what that says there? So if you're a, a boss or a supervisor, like I am, I have to remember that, see, I've got two employees in my office that, you know, I could be that type of boss that just goes in and just hands out work all the time and never really participates myself. And, and I try to get out of every bit of work that I do because I know I could just tell them to do it and they got to do it because they're subject to me. But there again, I, I see Christ sitting across from me and he's like, well, you, you as my follower, you're supposed to, you have a responsibility to do things I've commanded you. But guess what I did? I did everything that I commanded you to do and more. I gave my very life. See, I led by example, not just by instruction. So I, I cannot, as a Christian, be that big, bad boss that makes everybody do stuff while I sit back and enjoy the view. And I, can, I also need to take into effect um, how I give instruction. Okay? There's, there's many times at work that I could just really kind of, you know, go off the deep end if I wanted to because I'm the boss and I could just really say things in a hurtful and a mean and an authoritative way that probably wouldn't wind up getting the same results. But, um, and, and there's times I have to say things in an authoritative way as, as a boss you have to but I need to I need to look at it in this way what if I was on the other side of the desk and, and I was the employee and they were the boss how would I want them to instruct me and to manage me would I say things the exact same way that I, or would I want them to say things to me the, the same way that I say to them? And the Holy Spirit brings that to my mind, and, and I try to heed by that. I'm not a perfect person. 
I make mistakes in every part of this scripture that we have read today. Every single part of it. Um, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And, and thank God for that grace and that salvation because, you know, we all make mistakes every day. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both your master and theirs is in heaven and that there's no partiality with him. So God is my boss just like he's their boss. He, he's my authority just like he is their authority. And he can deal with me the same way he deals with anybody else. Okay, so we've, we've kind of dealt with the family there. And, and um, so the next verse kind of switches gears here again. Um, Paul's kind of trying to cover several things here in the last chapter before he closes out. So let's uh, start here at uh, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. See, we can't trust in our own strength. Excuse me, but we have to trust in the strength of His might, uh, because we've established that we can't we can't go every day without sinning. Uh, we can't live a perfect life. We have to trust in His strength, the strength of His might. How do we do that? Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. See, that's what we fight against: is the schemes of the devil. And daily we fight this. So um, we need to put on an armor. And let's see what that armor is. Uh, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. See, I try to remember this scripture when I see people who aren't living with God and, and they're doing a lot of things that I'm just like, why in the world are they doing that? Why in the world would, would they live that way? Um, I, I try to see it from this perspective. You know, we're, we're fighting spiritual forces. We're fighting Satan. We're not, we're not, I'm not fighting that person that is telling rumors on me, that, that's backbiting me. That to, to do things to try to come against me and, and make me look bad. That's, that's just the devil using that person to fight against me. See, I, I learned this through uh, from a certain uh, person in my life. It wasn't that person coming against me. Not really. I, I don't believe that person even realized that they were being used by Satan to, to try to come against me and, and tear me down and destroy my life. I don't think they even realize that I'm not fighting against that person. I'm fighting against spiritual powers, the rulers, uh, authorities, against cosmic powers, the present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. See, that's what we fight against. Therefore, in other words, so, because of this, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all, having done everything you can in your power, trusting the strength of his might to stand firm. See, that tells me don't give up. It may last a long time, Satan coming against me with everything he can or, or throwing little nagging things my way day by day and trying to wear me down. See, I, I'm to take up the whole armor of God and having done everything in my power and when I feel like I'm at the end of my rope with this situation, to stand firm. Stand firm in what? Stand therefore, next verse, having fastened on the belt of truth. See, this is, this is where we get into the armor. See, this, this armor is not anything that I can put on that I made because I can't fight among, with my own strength 
against principalities and powers of the air and against Satan and what he sends my way. I have to trust the strength of his might. Putting on the belt of truth. Well, what is the belt of truth? The truth that God has given us in his word. The truth of the gospel. It's empowering. Having uh, put on the breastplate of righteousness. See, we're to wear our righteousness right here over our heart to protect our heart from, from anything the enemy sends our way, including what we talked about the other week, sensuality, being led by our feelings, being led by our heart. See, my heart is desperately wicked. I don't know about yours, but, but I can I match what the Bible says. The, my heart is desperately wicked. I have to trust in his might and put on the, the breastplate of not my righteousness because my righteousness is as filthy rags, but put on the breastplate of Christ's righteousness and protect my heart from being led astray. Because the devil's smooth. See, he's tricky. He, he leads a lot of people away and astray by leading them by the thoughts of their heart, the desires of their heart. And as shoes for your feet, having, on, um, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. See, that re represents us going and doing the will of God. Going and doing. Uh, see, we, we walk with our shoes. We go places with our shoes. We are going and doing the things that God instructed us to do as Christians. Taking the gospel to the world with our words and with our actions in everything that we do. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. See, our, our faith is what guards us from what the fiery darts that the devil throws at us. See, we can take our faith n not in our strength, not in our ability, not in anything we can do, but we can take that shield of faith that God gave us, faith in his strength and his might, and we can throw that shield of faith up there and say, uh-uh, not today, Satan. I got the shield of the faith that Christ gave me and the faith that he knows exactly what you're throwing at me and he's, he's got the power to protect me with every piece of this armor that he has given me. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all, extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take up the helmet of of salvation the helmet of salvation now now where does a helmet go R right on right up here right on the top of your body right on the top of everything the helmet of salvation when I think of that you know when I think of this is the highest place on your body I, I think of where when Jesus said a city set on a hill cannot be hidden See, I put the helmet of salvation on all the way at the top. The very highest point of my body, that's where I'm wearing my salvation. And everybody can see it. See, he didn't say, put on the socks of salvation. Y'all can't see my socks, can you? He, did, he didn't put on, he, he didn't say, put on the t-shirt. Of salvation. I got a t-shirt up, up on up under this shirt. I always do. It's hidden. There can't nobody see it. If I didn't have this beard, you might could see the, the tip of it in the collar of this shirt. But you can't see it. It's hidden. I might get in trouble for this. <laughs> he didn't say put on your whitey tidies of salvation. Don't nobody see that. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> no, put on the helmet of salvation for everybody to see. I heard uh, Brother Ray McMillan last night on one of his Facebook Live videos say this. You are a walking billboard. 
for Christ. You're a walking billboard for Christ. Our salvation should be worn at, at, our, at the highest point in our lives so everybody automatically sees the, the crown, the helmet of salvation that we are wearing at all times. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the Word of God is like a two-edged sword. Remember Jesus talking about that? So the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. That is our means of attack against Satan. Remember when Christ was being tempted in the desert by Satan uh, during his fast? And what did he use to come against Satan every single time? He quoted the word of God. And every time Satan went away from him. The word of God will protect us against false doctrine, against false accusation, It'll protect us against the devil coming against us with discouragement. We, we need to use the word of God every day of our lives. It's the sword of the spirit. Praying at all times in the spirit and with all prayer and supplication. So praying at all times. So this may sound a little silly, but um, first time I read that, um, I was a teenager and I thought, at all times? That's all the time. We're, we're to pray at all times. Another part of the Bible says, pray without ceasing. Pray without stopping. Well, let me tell you what I think this means. I think as Christians, as followers of Christ, we ought to always have the mindset of prayer. See, when we see somebody and our first thought is why in the world would they be doing that? Why would they be living like they're living? I don't understand why people do that. Our very next thought ought to be prayer for those people. See, we, we ought to be always ready to pray. Now, we don't have to sit down, get on our knees, put our hands together and bow our heads and say some big prayer in the middle of a parking lot. When we, when we see something we're concerned about, no. See, we should always have the mindset of prayer. And you can say little quick prayers all day, all throughout the day in your mind. And we ought to practice doing that. We ought to train ourselves to do that every day of our lives, to stay in a mindset of prayer. You don't have to say a big old five minute, 10 minute, 30 minute prayer every time you pray. See, I teach the, the teenagers that they ought to set aside a time in their day for prayer. And we all ought to do that. Set aside a specific scheduled time for prayer and, and interaction with our God, yes. But we should not limit our prayer life to that one conversation daily. We should not limit our, our conversation with God to a scheduled time in the day, but we should always have an open line of communication with God. So that's what it means when it, when it says here, um, let's see, let me, I lost my spot here. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Uh, it says, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me. So Paul is, is telling the Ephesian church that we should, we should be praying for everybody. But also he's asking prayer for himself. And also for me, that the words may be given to me um, in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador, which we all are, by the way, in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So here's Paul. He's got on his armor. 
because he's chained to Roman guards under house arrest, suffering for the gospel, suffering for the church of Christ, the body of Christ. And he's not discouraged. He's not depressed. He's not complaining. What is he doing? He's asking them to pray for him, to have more boldness to continue to share the gospel boldly. Not just softly, throwing a little something here and there, but boldly. And I tell you what, other than Jesus Christ, I would probably have to say that in the Bible, Paul was probably the boldest preacher in the Bible, in the New Testament anyway. And he's praying for more boldness. So here we finish out the book of Ephesians. So that you also may know that I'm doing, uh, that how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. He's, he's sending Tychicus to them to give them an update on his situation. I have sent him to you for this very purpose so that you may know how we are and how we may encourage and that that we may encourage your hearts. So Paul's concern again is not on himself. His concern is for the gospel and the church. So he sent Antiochus to, to go and give them a report and encourage them to continue in the faith. He closes the book out this way. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ's grace. Or, excuse, I read that all wrong. Let me start that over. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. And there Paul closes out this letter to the Ephesians. I think Ephesians is a wonderful book. I hope you, after, especially after this study, feel the same. Um, it's always been one of my favorite books. And, and again, I feel like God has, has really revealed a lot to me in the past few years about Ephesians. <coughs> And I hope you've got something out of this teaching. Um, uh, you know, I always, um, after every um, lesson that I teach, I kind of beat myself up afterwards uh, thinking, well, I should have said it this way or should have said it that way. But, but, you know, in the end, I trust that God said through me what he wanted to say, and I hope you got blessed by it and, and you heard it with your spiritual ears and it takes root in your heart and mind. So let's, let's pray to close out this um, Sunday School lesson. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that you didn't just kind of give us some instructions and throw us out there, sink or swim, to do the best we could. But you not only gave us your word, but God, you empower us to hear it and to understand it. You even empower us to apply it in our life. You're the one that gives us the desire to do what you've instructed us to do. Thank you, God, that you do all the work for us and that we just accept it by faith, what you've done. God, thank you for that. God, I pray that you would empower us through your Holy Spirit as you did the, the apostles to boldly proclaim the word to hear the word ourselves, not just be hearers, but to be doers. And not just to be members of the body um, listening to teaching, but that we would turn around and be workers in the body, teaching others. God, I pray that this COVID-19 situation we're going through right now, that you would bless your church God, I, I feel like you have blessed us during this and through this. But I, God, I pray that you would help us to come out of this and to come out of it stronger and healthy 
healthy as a body of believers. And God, help it be soon. God, will thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hope y'all have a great week. We will see you next time.